Well, I'm still wearing my mask and uh, I was just spent the weekend in the COVID ward. So a couple of experiences, uh, COVID is now switching to, to younger people. Uh, COVID is still quite widespread. Uh, it can occur from being in the hospital. It can be occurring from just about anywhere. So please take your precautions. And what I also know is that 75% of individuals have at least one risk factor if you're an adult of having a, a, an adverse effect on COVID risk factors. By far the leading problem is unfortunately being overweight. So the message is isolation, um, wear your mask and, and, and be smart about things. But another message is lose weight, exercise safely and preferably outdoors if you can, it's good for your psyche. Uh, if I can lose 20 pounds, so can you, uh, make that a priority. When it comes to vaccinations is that vaccinate as soon as you can. There is always a disagreement or arguments on um, how to interpret vaccine research. And science is hard to understand. Things are changing on a readily basis, but all the current vaccines are 90% effective at decreasing hospitalization or deaths from COVID. I'll repeat that. The most important marker success is that all current vaccines are very effective at decreasing hospitalizations for COVID and deaths from COVID, 90% effectiveness. The vaccines were tested at different times with different strains, so it's hard to judge one vaccine from the other. Now, when it comes to the AstraZeneca vaccine, there is a concern about side effects. Perspective, 22,000 people have died from COVID in Canada up until date, and that number is still climbing. As of March 16th, there was basically about seven or eight cases of clotting abnormalities and about uh, 18 cases or so of funny brain clots that led to, to strokes. So that's about 25 cases in about um, 15 million people vaccinated. Again, uh, COVID is a, a deadly disease in some. Uh, we can't always predict, but do yourself, do, do yourself a favor, consider vaccination early, consider vaccination as soon as you possibly can. The science will change and to me all the vaccines look, look, look wonderful. Um, so I got vaccinated. I've been, it's, it's a privilege to be in, in this position. I, I wish you happy vaccinations as quickly as you can. You're going to see a webinar today about my experience with COVID. Unfortunately, I've seen well over 50 cases and we'll spend more time to discussing that in the future. Uh, remember, a third of COVID is asymptomatic. And if you get hospitalized with COVID or you go to the ICU, you have about a 30 to 40 percent chance you have a severe clotting disorder, blood clots in your lungs, your brain. Uh, so the best way to treat COVID is to prevent it from happening in the first place. Good isolation techniques are important. Uh, staying, staying social distancing. Other important factors are is treat your risk factors, treat your blood pressure, know your diabetes, know your weight, know your risk factors and work hard with your doctors. There's other diseases besides COVID as well. And finally, vaccination, extremely effective, extremely safe. Uh, the science is changing. I would be pleased to get any vaccine that's been offered to you. Uh, get it as quickly as you possibly can. I hope that's helpful. Again, science goes at its own pace. Re research is sometimes hard to interpret and science is science. So results change and we'll keep you up to date as best we can. I hope you take the time to look at some of the uh, webinars that we've done. We've done two on vaccines so far. We're going to do another one coming up in the, in, in the future. So be safe, uh, learn from science, take the time to, to know the facts and just don't re react to emotion. What I learned is that bad news travels fast, good news travels slowly. Once again, the vaccines are 90% effective of decreasing severe disease, such as hospitalization and also mortality from COVID. Once you've been vaccinated, it looks like it's blocking transmission. And we're learning more about that, which is new information. And it's quite unusual uh, to have a repeat infection, at least for within six months after the vaccine. Whether or not we require more vaccine, vaccinations in the future, time will tell. I suspect we'll require uh, booster doses as time goes on, but that's just for speculation and we'll learn soon. Be safe. Put together a series to start of four um, events that will happen on the third Wednesday at lunchtime. And it'll discuss many various issues that are coming up in daily life from a family physician's perspective, but it's also a time just to chat and to connect. And so 
Um, I'd like to be able to uh, turn this over to Dr. Kernew, but I will be managing the slides. And uh, please, Dr. Kernew, um, take it away. Well, thank you so much. If you um, uh, look at that previous slide, that's our newest addition to the house. That's called Ticker. That's our little baby goat. So um, one of the things is we have three goats at home. Uh, I have lots of disclosures and um, and all the money I collect from all these things just go into funds on, on, on prevention. And uh, so uh, everybody should get a goat. Uh, that's the indoor goat right now. We, we bottle feed. I got to name one of them and it just follows you around like a dog and things that nature as well. So we're trying new things. We're also trying virtual medicine for the, the first time. A couple of years ago, I never heard of the word Zoom before or WebEx and that sort of changed the world in, in, in many ways. I'd be curious to see what people are doing. We're using Medio at the office here as well. Um, and, you know, I remember when COVID first started, um, you know, what is this disease? You know, like everybody got their temperature taken and uh, it was felt, you know, is that uh, you can touch something and you can get COVID, but most of it's actually transmitted by aerosol secretions. And I think you know all these things. And uh, it, one of the things that the question is, does, that, does a mask work? It should be two layers or three layers. How long can you use it right now? Um, to me is that the, the only good randomized control trial was one in one of the Scandinavian countries that showed a decrease in transmission for about 16% or so. So I think number one reason why surgical masks were designed were for surgeons to not spit on their patients. Um, and uh, so it prevents you from spreading the disease. So I, so I tell people who don't wear a mask is you give yourself a license to kill somebody. So um, I know it's a, it's a broad statement. I don't always use that statement, but that's the main reason is to protect other people if you're asymptomatic. And you know, probably asymptomatic transmission is at least a third of disease at this stage. You know, how do we give ongoing care? Next slide, please. You know, that's a change right now. So I try to share you some thoughts on, on COVID. So here's a patient I saw, um, she's, 83 years of age. She, she's congestive heart failure. She has atrial fibrillation. She had TIA. She had gastric bypass surgery at one time. Uh, she got her weight down to a body mass index around 30. Uh, she was in one of our clinical trials uh, and actually it was in the Emperor congestive heart failure trial and she had a pro BNP of 4,000 which is uh, really quite high. So when I heard this lady got COVID, um, uh, what do you think? What do you think her outcome is going to be? Any any guesses? Next slide, please. Well, it turns out she's asymptomatic, and I would have never predicted this lady to do well. Unfortunately, her husband passed away from COVID, but she sailed through this with all the risk factors: age, body mass index, um, you know, congestive heart failure, and high pro BNP. So figure that. How do you how do you, how you know what? And if you look at what's happened in nursing homes, is that between a third of 50% of people who are in a nursing home who have a life expectancy of about two years will succumb to the disease. So just because you're old doesn't mean you're gonna die from this disease. So it's kind of kind of interesting or have bad outcomes. Uh, next slide, please. And if you look at, here's another patient that called me up that she happens to be, this is Barbara. She's actually was the, uh, uh, the my daughter's hockey team, one of the one of the grandmothers that came back from, from Florida. So she went to Florida, she um, in March, was around a lot of people. She lost her sense of smell and taste, and she still to she started to develop palpitations and some funny chest pains. Um, and at that time, uh, when she had her COVID test done a month later or, or so, it was negative. Um, and she's asking about antibody testing. I'd be curious to see people's experience with that. But she lost her sense of smell or taste. Um, she had new chest pains, and uh, we actually did a um, her echo was normal. She had ST elevation uh, on her Holter monitor, which is a marker of proximal LED disease or, or vasospasm. Uh, you know, Gary's on the on the talk here. And we, we, way back when we saw ST elevation on a Holter monitor, we, we got really nervous. And she went for an angiogram during the COVID pandemic. And uh, the, the first view showed a 90% proximal LED lesion. So they're going to actually dilate it. And they took a picture again, went away. It was all spasm and thrombus of that vessel. And you know that COVID can be associated with thrombus and uh, hypercoagulability and injury of the heart. And, and so she got basically treated for vasospasm, for blood pressure um, and beta blocker therapy. And she's fine two months later. Um, but she probably would have died if... Um, we didn't find out because you no, know, she had like a 90% lesion that was thrombus and spasm uh, with, with on her Holter monitor also showed some polymorphic VT 
uh, associate with SD Elevation. So, uh, and that was just by accident. You no, know, she just called me up one Sunday afternoon and said, I'm not feeling well. And uh, that led to testing uh, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, and we've been fortunate enough to open early and, and test uh, quite, quite safely. Uh, next slide, please. So there's just a whole repertoire from a person who I thought bad things were going to happen to, uh, to somebody um, that uh, did well. So what we learned so far is that uh, you don't stop the anti-failure medications and you don't, you don't stop managing diabetes. And one of the tests that I find really, really helpful is, is uh, pro-BNP and BNP, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. If you have an elevation of brain natric polypeptide, you're, you're probably at risk for, for heart failure. You're, the heart's elevated. And that's usually a, uh, a marker for bad things to help you, to, to have and, 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 and cause problems. Remember, BNP uh, is three to four, two to four times less compared to pro-BNP. So pro-BNP over a thousand is a marker for debts. And that's something that you need to be aware of. That's something that costs $75 to, to do. It's not covered uh, by the government, but something that I use a lot of when, when I can and something you should consider that. So either BNP or pro-BNP. Next slide, please. Um, and, you know, there's this delay of going to the hospital, um, when to go and when not to go. And I think we have those conversations all the time. And it's interesting is that I'm not doing as many ECGs on people, but I'm doing a lot more stress testing. So I figure if we're going to expose ourselves, we'll, we'll do an echo and a stress test and get a lot of valuable information as quickly as we possibly can. And of course, halter monitoring and different technologies. I'm quite impressed with uh, the cardiac monitoring device and uh, the Apple Watch as well as regular monitoring. So I really thank my staff who uh, weathered through the storm and, uh, um, and we've done good. They've done good. Next slide, please. And, uh, you know, went to, uh, you know, with therapies and things of that nature as well. And I think we're all learning the really only proven therapy uh, for, for therapy that really works well is steroids. When you're hypoxic, you're quite sick. Uh, the other stuff doesn't seem to work. I have to always watch about medications that prolong QT uh, intervals. Um, um, I don't see this as a big problem, but something to keep your eyes on. People prone to arrhythmia, those sick or bad hearts. Next slide, please. A lot more atrial fibrillation, a lot more difficulties. And you know, do you, should you go on a NOAC or on warfarin? Right now is that I, I don't prescribe warfarin right now because it's just oh, too hard to go to the lab and things of that nature. So all, all those patients, are, I think we all switched to NOACs at this stage. If you've been rock stable on warfarin, you want to stay, you have valve problems, you know, rheumatic heart, mitral stenosis, fine, but uh, or have some metal in you at some point, to, you know, uh, with uh, mechanical valves, you need to be on warfarin therapy. But NOACs have really changed the world quite a bit. Next slide, please. Um, prescription renewals. Wow. You know, um, I think I spend, uh, probably about 20 patients a day. We have to renew their prescription renewals. So to me, I'll renew anything that crosses my desk. That sounds reasonable right now. Cause people are having trouble getting access to, uh, to care. Um, and we did a webinar and Maria, who's uh, one of, is one of our projects and said that, uh, in, Good EMRs, only 16% of them are accurate when it comes to medication. So I think the weakest part of all EMRs are uh, prescriptions. So I spent a lot of time, when I get a prescription renewal, uh, I call I call the patient up and make sure we're on the, all the medications are renewed at the same time when possible. If I can get through the patient, number one, and number two, the patient can convey to me what they're taking. Um, that's a challenge. Um, but I think we, and then, Sometimes I just have to bring people in to figure out what they're taking, bring their bags of pills in, because what's on their list, what they say uh, are two different things. So I uh, spent a lot more time thinking about that and um, feel proud that we're, you know, working better at that. And we have a good pharmacist here uh, in our building that's really helpful too as well. So spend time getting medications right and how to do things outpatient-wise in cardiology. That's changed tremendously. You know, people don't want to be in the hospital. I get it. And uh I think we can do good effective therapies. And I would say 70% of what we do is virtually, 30% is, is in, in house right now. So, um, and uh, I think, you know, we work on early in the morning, we work at night. I think I'm averaging about 16 hours a week most days. I work weekends. We're having a clinic this, uh, this, uh, this Saturday. We had to change the time around because I might be on the COVID ward. I'm on the backup service for COVID on Saturday and Sunday. 
and the, the backup COVID ward is open. So it uh, looks like I'm going to the hospital this weekend and uh, we'll do the clinic at nighttime this, uh, this Saturday if we need to have one if, if possible. I hope the COVID ward gets closed again, but um, we'll see what happens. Next slide, please. So this, this disease is real. Sad man stopping medications. I, I, I'm starting to do a better job about this. I love sulfonylureas because they're dirt cheap, but they do cause hypoglycemia and some weight discomfort. You know, you're not going to stop ACRB therapy. You're going to adjust diuretic therapy. You know, are you gaining weight? Are you gaining that two to five pounds? Are your legs swollen? Uh, are you short of breath? I find that people can, who can't lie flat in bed who could be, that's probably heart failure. Uh, swollen legs, short of breath could be anything from just overweight deconditioning to, cal to calcium blockers. Lots of things to think about. Next slide, please. Um, now, the, you know, metformin may have protective effects in COVID. ARB and ACE are, are neutral. Anti-inflammatories will reduce pain. They're associated with bad things to kidneys, heart, and um, brain. The SGL2 tetrodot antagonist, well, we can talk a lot about this, um, this euglycemic diabeticoacidosis. I haven't seen any of that yet. It's pretty rare. The only thing I caution people about is people who have leg ulcers uh, that are active, not to, to, be, to be on them. They've been a game changer. And so uh, we're privileged to have two diabetic educators that come to our clinic. Thank you, Jackie, for having one come in on a regular basis. Um, I now become managing diabetes. I'm now managing renal insufficiency. Uh, remember when you start an SGL2 antagonist, they have a very weak impact on blood pressure. Um, the, um, they protect the kidneys, the GFR will worsen. And we'll talk about more of that over time, but they decrease end-stage renal disease by, by 40%. They're basically lousy diabetic drugs, but they're phenomenally good heart failure drugs. When I say they're lousy diabetic drugs, they, they work at a GFR of above 45 to 60 for diabetes. Um, a lot of the patients that we see have GFRs, you know, well less than 60, down to 20, 30. And, and you know that uh, they're now being tested in people whose GFRs are down to zero, provided your GFR was 30 before you started. So this is a game changer for heart failure management. It's a game changer uh, for kidney protection. So, 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 you know, who should start them? Every one of us should start them and, and follow those patients. Next slide, please. Um, when you come to COVID, really, what, a, what an interesting disease. Who would have thought I'd learn immunology at 61 years of age? But uh, I, I, I know, I remember now T cells and B cells and uh, interferon. And apparently, if you have a poor interferon pathway, which is important for early attacks on your immune system, you're, you're at risk for complications from COVID. Um, when issue came out is that it looked like myocarditis was relatively common. Certainly, if you go to a hospital, you have a positive troponin, your mortality is probably at least doubled. Um, in the initial MR studies that done in athletes, up to 40% of athletes had some dis have some evidence of myocarditis or involvement on MR studies of the heart that were tested, quite selective people that were tested initially. We know about the entry into the lungs by aerosolized sec secretions. We know the effects of rhythm atrial fibrillation and heart disease. Next slide, please. We also realize that simply this. Now, this is a bad slide by, because it's a picture slide, but it's a phenomenally important slide. It tells us that if you have, and you know, getting old, I can't prevent that, but you can age better. Um, but overweight counts 30% of mortality. Diabetes, 20%, and hypertension, another 26%. Um, so 60% plus of mortality or hospitalization in the United States um, is associated with these risk factors. So I don't know what we're doing about how to manage these things better, especially weight management. Next slide, please. So I put a lot of emphasis about this because um, we know that COVID increases the risk of myocardial infarction. We know that influenza increases the risk of myocardial infarction. We know that from way back when. And, um, and you know, if, um, the, we, we, we have to optimize our medical therapy where we are trying to figure out. We have to figure out what's causing those rhythms and chest pain. So, you know, uh, but just thinking access to blood work has been a problem, um, but uh, move through to this. And, um, you know, when you have reduced ejection fractions, you need to be on six different medications. Where I do find SGL2 receptor antagonists are the easiest drugs to use because they really don't affect blood pressure. They don't affect... Uh, uh, potassium, and you will see, you will initially see a fall in GFR above between five to 25%. Um, so we need to, you know, maximize that. And so during this um, pandemic, I finally got my shingle shot, um, uh, one of our webinars, and um, 
uh, I got my first, uh, I got the, I got the Pfizer vaccine. I would take any vaccine possible. In fact, I'll take one of each if, as time goes on, if I, if, if, if need be. Um, and uh, so I just encourage people and, and really talk about people about vaccinations and show off your vaccine if you like. Uh, next slide, please. And when you're pushed against this. So um, we talk about COVID is, is a fast pandemic on top of the slow pandemic, obesity and diabetes. And, you know, since I started practice and many of you, diabetes has tripled. Um, and tonight, actually, we're doing a, what we call it the sugar hour. We're actually doing from between six and seven. We're going to talk about how to put diabetes into remission. So bottom line, if you lose 20 to 30 pounds, and you've been a diabetic for five years or, or less, um, you can put diabetes into remission in close to 75% of people if you're willing to work at it, but really work at it. Next slide, please. And, the, you know, the message about isolation, I get it. Message of wearing Mac, I get it. But the message, losing weight, exercise more, and be outside safely, and yesterday, I'm with one of my patients. He is getting rich this year. What he does is that uh, he sells ice cream. And this has been the most profitable year ever in 50 years for ice cream sales. Uh, alcohol consumption in Ontario is up by 30 to 40 percent. Um, what's going on? You know, I know I understand this. You know, the first little while we have our comfort zones and things that need to change well, but getting outside, which is safer and and if you can do it safely, you know, we, we, I think the message is lose weight, exercise more and be outside safely should be a key public health message. We're going to pay a price. Um, you know, if I can lose 20 pounds during the pandemic, why should you gain 20? Um, and it's, you know, body mass index over 25 kills for all sorts of things from cancer, heart disease, diabetes, blindness, infections. In fact, people who um, have a body mass index over 30 uh, have more pneumonias, uh, more bronchitis. Um, independent of all the risk factors. So to me, figuring these things out is so important. And I'd be curious to see what people are trying to do to encourage that. Uh, I don't know about you, the single most important thing I can do is to be as physically active at godly hours. I, I mean, I do the Shadok stairs when nobody's there at six in the morning. Uh, you can do that with us Monday and Fridays or seven o'clock on Tuesday nights. That's, uh, uh, it's it's kind of neat. People are happy there. You're, and uh playing tennis once a week, going bike riding last week, just 60 kilometers of bike riding. My feet are frozen, but it's great times to be out there. And uh, please find a way to be, to incorporate that, encourage your patients to do that. Next slide, please. Uh, that's a key message. So we know right now in Canada, unfortunately, 22,000 people died, mostly from, a lot from nursing homes, but being overweight, having hypertension, diabetes, accounts for 60% of mortality. And so while heart disease still kills 50,000 people a year, um, diabetes has tripled, overweight, we're getting more overweight. We need to figure a way to, to change that. So if I'm the Ontario government, if I'm the federal, we have to reach, re refocus on Canada a little bit. So Canada should be top producer of things like blueberries and apples and whole wheat food and uh, renewable energy and um, you know have the best bikes in the world. Um, I bought myself a, a, a fat tire bike and I fell, fell off that bike a bunch of times, a lot of fun. Um, and also learning that is that most of COVID, or at least a third of COVID is asymptomatic. And that's why wearing things are gonna be important. And the vaccines are all phenomenal. You can decide what vaccine you want. I'll take any vaccine because all of them are at least 90% effective of decreasing hospitalization and deaths um, and also blocking transmission. So um, you can argue about blood clots. Uh, basically, blood clots are a disease of older people that are overweight, have risk factors and sedentary. So get out there and walk. That's the best thing you can do to help prevent blood clots and try to lose a few cases. So far, we have 42 cases of COVID that, uh, that we've looked after. Um, the vast majority have done extremely well. Um, uh, one or two of that so-called fog chronic syndrome that's taken place. Um, and uh, it's really a, a tough disease, but COVID will actually... Uh, leave its mark on getting people to be less active, more depressed, more sad. But to me, I never thought I'd be talking to you at you know, 12 noon or for only 20 minutes. I have like a two hour discussion right now. And, uh, but I'm looking at it. So uh, I, I love to see people that have COVID or who had COVID. Um, I think I've become in one sense, a more palliative care doctor for people in stage congestive heart failure, but also um, um, 
I get to talk to people that need to be talked to um, on, on, on a weekend um, and or, or, or whatever. So I appreciate the fact that we can actually do these new new things. And uh, I'm grateful for the team that we put together. Next slide, please. So just think about how you look at this. And this is actually, um, you know, Austin Matthews, he got COVID. And, and the more recent data saying is if you're a professional athlete and you've been asymptomatic or symptomatic, you're going to do well with COVID. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm a lousy hockey player. Uh, but um, I worked on getting skinnier exercising. So what this tells us is that if you exercise and keep your weight down, uh, good things will happen to you with COVID. So that's the message um, to me is that uh, instead of watching hockey, play hockey in some way or, or pick a sport that you can do that. Um, really important. Next slide, please. This is the data. I, I won't believe that you can take a picture of that what you want to, but basically the data suggests that, that most people that get COVID uh, who are looking after themselves will have much less complications. It's not, it's not a, no guarantees. You know, I, I showed you one patient, I thought bad things would happen, nothing bad happened to. Someone uh, had a weird presentation and there are people in, you know, a family of four, um, one, one dies, two get sick, one or one, one's asymptomatic and uh, predicting it is hard, but weight, blood pressure, age, other comorbidities are, are, are very, very helpful. Uh, next slide, please. So time to fight back. So, we do a short presentation Wednesdays, which is pre-recorded or I don't talk. Uh, that's why it's 30 minutes. On Fridays, we do a live one that's usually about two hours. You name it, we've done it. Um, from plant-based eating to genetics to uh, bariatric surgery, triglycerides, atrial fibrillation. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have over 200 webinars. This is Devanshi. She's phenomenal. Um, she leads our, um, our weight loss crew. Uh, and so basically Tuesdays at seven o'clock, we have a Zoom meeting. Um, and let me show you the group. Uh, this is, um, uh, next slide please. And uh, so, we, and these are people, most of them have never used Zoom before. Um, we're all using Zoom. On, we actually, there are Tuesdays at seven o'clock uh, and Wednesdays at seven o'clock, we have the, the, the three M's, mindful meditation and movement. So building resilience, uh, we have um, different events. And next slide please. We have uh, once a month, we're now having batch cooking. Um, and uh, so the next one is on April the 11th. So uh, uh, we're touring Canada. Last time we looked at the prairies and I uh, forget what we're gonna talk about coming up this year. So, you know, people who lean towards plant-based eating, healthy batch cooking, we'll work with you in that direction and uh, look forward to that in person at some point in time, but uh, the world has changed and um, we need to change too as well. We, have, we live in a wonderful country. Next slide, please. So everybody's welcome, um, but really important is um, take a picture of this. Um, there's my cell number. If you need to call me, text me, welcome. Um, uh, the, the email, I, I have 6,000 emails behind. This one over here has our office address 232. That's how I can remember that one. But Jen keeps an eye on that. So if, if something needs to be done, we'll do it. OTN is another way we, we can be in contact as well. But I want people to have discussions. Be afraid, not be afraid to, to call contact because that's somehow being lost. And uh, I really enjoy discussions with people from patients to, to you guys and your experience. So I know I can talk really fast and uh, I just want to show you how COVID has changed our little world. And I'd be curious to see how it's changed your world. So um, why don't we uh, open up, everybody unmute themselves. They can talk if they want to answer any questions, thoughts from anybody. And how hey, do you- Dr. Carnu, um, there's just a couple of questions in the chat first. Um, that we'd like to have addressed and my colleague Christine will read them out for you. Thank you. Uh, so we'll read out the questions and then open it up. I just want to make a quick uh, reminder and uh, shout out to let everyone know. Uh, same time, same place. Uh, the next third Wednesday of April uh, 21st, we will be hosting Dr. Kernu again, the three F's in diabetes, frequent, fatal, and forgotten. And we will send out a reminder to you as well. So first question uh, is coming from Dr. Zarka. If you are on Entresto, should you still be on an SGLT2? Or if you are on an SGLT2, should you still add Entresto if you have CHF? Yeah, so if your ejection fraction, great question, is less than 40%. So if we backtrack, if you have a diagnosis of congestive heart failure, your five-year mortality is 50%. If you have congestive heart failure, especially you've been hospitalized, the chance of you living five years is 50-50. If your ejection fraction is 20% or less, your one-year mortality is 50%. And so 
what we know is that it's now a category six medication. So what I want to do is get resting heart rate to around 60 beats per minute. So I use beta blockers. This is for sinus rhythm. And if I can't, I use a babradine. Um, now, if the LV function ejection fraction less than 40%, then you want to be on some form of RAS blocker. And Tresto is a RAS blocker. It has Valsartan in there, plus it has a second agent. Um, and it's better than ACE or ARB therapy by about 20%, but it's more, it's more difficult to use because of blood pressure effect. There are three doses, low, medium, and high, so I'll, I'll use that. Um, spironolactone uh, is a phenomenal drug that decreases mortality uh, from uh, about 25%. SGL2 receptor antagonists are in fact the easiest drugs to all to use. They don't affect potassium. Uh, they have a very small effect on um, on, on, on blood pressure. And so they're, they're much more easier drugs. So to me, if when I have systolic dysfunction, I want to be on an SGL2 antagonist very quickly and very early on. I find Entresto is a harder drug to use because it affects blood pressure. And, and, and patients may or may not have a blood pressure machine. Um, and, and you have to worry about potassium. The, the GFR fall, which you get with SGL3 receptors, is predictable. And in fact, right now, the trials say if, you're, if your GFR is greater than probably 20 to 30, uh, you can be safely put on it. Not as a diabetic medication because you need, you need a GFR of 40, uh, 45 to 60 to lower blood sugar. But down to basically dialysis, you can remain on an SGL3 antagonist safely. The only thing is yeast infections. Uh, maybe more urinary tract infection, but yeast infections it occurs in about five to ten percent of people. Some people find that they're 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 peeing too much. Well, I think it's a good thing. I don't know about you, Gary. As I get older, I want to pee a lot uh, more, and uh, they they help me pee. But some patients just don't 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 like it. Um, uh, and they decrease end stage renal disease by forty percent. They decrease mortality, hospitalization by heart failure by thirty percent. They decrease development of heart failure by 30%. So why in the hell are you, are you going to be not be on them if you have uh, diabetes, number one? Number two, if your ejection fraction is less than 40%, it's independent of LV function, independent of diabetes. The hardest thing to do is you're a family doctor. When do you start them? You know, you're a 40 year old type two diabetic. Do I, do, do I go on a drug that's $3 a day? Um, or do I go on a drug like Ozempic, which is $250 a month? Do I go on sulfonuria, which is 10 cents a day? Um, and so you have to make those determinations based on insurance, cost, and other multiple factors. But when I see people, they're at risk for heart failure. So if you had, you know, over the age of 50, uh, you've been diabetic for 10 years, you have renal dys dysfunction, it's, it's an easy thing to be on because you're at risk for heart failure. Um, the prevention of myocardial infarction and stroke by, by SQ3 receptor is it's pretty small. You need, you need a minute analysis to squeeze that out of there, but you only need one trial and you have seven trials that show heart failure protection and, um, and, and kidney protection. And probably a kidney protection, 40% reduction in stage renal disease, disease is, is pretty strong. So I kind of like them. Um, so I try to pee on every category of medications, potassium, you have to be attentive, blood pressure you have to be cognizant of that. So, uh, uh, and so, you know, I'm lucky to have an echo machine in my office so I can actually tell you what your ejection fraction is. I can do a stress test. I can do a whole term monitor. Um, getting blood getting blood work in a blood pressure machine at a whole, and that's the hardest delays that we have. And uh, so I, um, and it's probably you don't have like an ulcer on your leg. Um, I'm pretty darn happy to use all those categories of medication very quickly in combination. Um, so it's not one drug, it's like the Toronto Raptors, you know, like you need a crew of people, you need your superstars back. And this still true that antagonists are a great superstar. Um, uh, so, and Entresto is a phenomenally good drug, but blood pressure effect, you know, you're dizzy and you're weak and your blood pressure is 90. That's a tough drug to be on. Uh, and I still like digoxin for anotropic effects, you know, it's, you know, it's, you know and, uh, so it's a, it's a weak agent, uh, but it can help with end-stage heart failure. And Lasix has been a good friend for all of us for, for many years and how to use that. Um, and I love spironolactone, but hyperkalemia is a problem. And now, now it looks like spironolactone decreases ancient age real disease or derivative of that, the bear drug by about 15%. So I, I think it, uh, it, it will work as well as well. So we have three categories of drugs to protect the kidneys, the spironolactone derivatives, the SGL2 antagonist, which has the biggest effect. And then we have ACRB therapy that's been around for forever. Um, and their effects are independent diabetes. Long answer, short question. Go ahead. Next question. Okay.
Thank you so much, Dr. Kernu, uh, for answering that. Uh, we have another question coming from uh, Dr. Nambury. Is there any risk factors to predict the cardiac injury after COVID-19? Yeah. So I'm impressed that, um, uh, that you know, if you go to a hospital, you're sick, your troponin level will be elevated. And that's a predictor increased mortality. It just means there's been myocardial damage. Uh, you can't get troponin values in outside labs because they just don't, they, want to, they don't want to measure it them because they don't want to take the responsibility of tracking people down. So if you're sick, you need to be in the hospital. If you're not sick or you're or, or in between that, yeah, you come to places that can evaluate. So um, having abilities to do ECG, echo, stress test, monitoring, measuring blood pressure, figuring out what pills there are, is that uh, something that many of us are taking, taking pride in doing this. At, um, and uh, so I forgot what the question was. I got myself lost there. Is there any risk factors to predict yeah. the cardiac injury after COVID-19? Yeah. So what I, what I learned is that the traditional risk factors, so I think is that uh, what causes heart disease causes mortality for COVID. Uh, so if you have high blood pressure, diabetes, and what I'm seeing right now is that I really spent a lot of time looking at diastolic function right now, looking for increased pressure on the echo. Is my left ventricular hypertrophy? Do I have echo criteria of diastolic dysfunction, okay, that predicts mortality and heart failure. And, and so basically, you know that most of COVID is asymptomatic and you know that these young athletes that, that, um, that have been tested, uh, they're doing quite well. Now we don't routinely do screening after the flu influenza, so we don't really have a good background to this. So I think you just have to go how the patient's doing. I presented a patient who, who was near syncope having bad rhythm problems. So those patients need intensification. But if you're doing well, it's a good question. So we have about oh, 40 patients that have had COVID and we're looking at their hearts so far and all the hearts haven't really changed that much. In fact, the biggest chamber that gets in trouble with COVID, it happens to be the right ventricle because of pneumonias. Um, so that's a work in progress right now. So I, I would just go by risk factors, age, hypertension, how you're feeling, blood pressure, diabetes, and this is a time to lose 20 pounds. Do, do what you can to make that work in some way. Um, that's, that's the biggest protector about um, your, your heart and your, all your risk factors. They all go together. You don't die because of COVID. You die of COVID and complications of COVID from other diseases. Um, what the athletes are telling us and young people are telling us is that less symptoms, um, uh, except in young kids with this Kawasaki's disease and things of that nature as well. So we're a lot more about, you know, we're going to learn more about chronic fatigue again through, uh, through the fogs, phases of these sorts of things. So uh, I'm learning so much. And the final answer is that's just treat risk factors and treat them well. Don't wait. Um, does uh, anyone else have any questions? Please unmute yourself and uh, address directly. Thank you. I got a question for, for Gary. So um, how, how, you know, working in the ICU, working in the clinic, how has things changed for you? What are you, what are you doing differently? And um, I'd be curious to see what your experience is. You have to unmute yourself, Gary. So uh, in the office is where I've noticed the difference because what I'm doing is using it to my advantage, saying that, uh, you know, uh, people that are afraid of getting a bad COVID outcome, I'm trying to do the same as you, coach them into the fact that if they're in better shape going into it, that they'll have better outcomes. And so uh, trying to, you know, use the opportunity to do what you're talking about. And so, uh, but I've been really uh, saying that if your diabetes is in good shape and your blood pressure and your, uh, if your heart failure is well treated and if your COPD is well treated, that you'll have a better outcome. But I, did, I had a question and the one is about why is hypertension such a, a marker for bad outcomes compared to things that you would just naturally think were marker like heart failure and uncontrolled diabetes and COPD. Yet hypertension is one of the strongest. What's, what do you think the reason for that is? Yeah, this is just speculation. I think you have hypertension means you have damaged vessels. Hypertension is, you know, to get hypertension, there's something wrong with your whole cardiovascular system. They're, they're, you're atherosclerotic, you know, your, your, your arteries are diseased. You know, the blood pressure doesn't go up because of the fun of it. You know, like when you do it, if you look at echoes, right? When you see this filling pressure that, that, that goes up on echoes, there's a thickened, fibrotic heart. Um, same thing must be happening in the vessel wall. Um, you know, so, so to me is that um, hypertension is a masker for bad things to happen to you. Now, Valentine Fuster, 
I've done a lot of work in, in younger people with pre atherosclerosis. And, you know, an average 30 year old individual, over a third already have atherosclerotic plaque. Uh, you know, from the Korean War, 25% of Americans at the age of 21 have atherosclerosis or fatty streaks. So, one of the things that we've done really badly is we wait till you have your heart attack, then we get aggressive. And what we learned from genetic studies of lipids and other diseases, it's better to treat intensely, but it's also important to treat uh, longer. And so when I started my practice, I would never thought of putting someone with thinner hypercholesterolemia on a cholesterol drug at 14. Um, I now do that in, in some patients. Um, I'm now starting to use something called polygenic scores. Uh, genetics are important. And so if you're genetically programmed to have bad things happen to you, you got to start treating earlier. And, you know, is it's hard to treat when everything's done and over with. So uh, and I think hypertension just means that you have a very diseased uh, vascular system and you're, you're not in great shape. You shouldn't have hypertension. Um, and uh, and so, so, so that's my take on it. You have you probably have a lot of vascular disease that's unrecognized. What do you think? Well, it must be. It's just that it's, a, it's relative ranking compared to, say, someone who actually has heart failure. Yeah. It just seems to be... Out of proportion, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah, so, yeah. and so it's, uh, I just thought it was curious. Yeah. I'm also amazed too um, how some people in a family of, you know, four that, you know, the two parents are both diseased with vascular disease. They look almost identical, yet one gets a little bit sick and one dies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what, you know, and we talk about this interferon pathway, whatever, I'm sure it's more complicated than that, but um, um, I'm still searching why um, one individual now, it's important how much the virus load you get at the beginning, for instance, like a big inoculation versus small inoculation. Is that, you know, we talk about super spreader events and things of that nature, or, you know, if I uh, cough on your face with a lot of virus, is that worse than just rubbing my hands to your nose or something and get a little of the virus? I, I, I don't know about that. I haven't seen much about that, but um, um, I think we still have a lot to learn. Um, but uh, I'm quite impressed is that if you look after yourself, Good things happen from cancer, heart disease, diabetes, longevity, nursing home. Because remember, the last two years of most people's lives if they're in a nursing home is not great quality. Um, and so, you know, I hope to retire when I turn 100, go in a nursing home 105, and die at 107 if all goes well. I, I, I get that lucky. Um, and, and when I see people at 50 years of age who are ready to, you know, retire and die, it's, it's kind of sad. And uh, so it's time to fight back. And you, you can't wait till the spring. You can't wait till the gym to open. You got you to start today. Um, on, that uh, note, on that note, Dr. Kernew, I'd just like to uh, close out before people start, uh, you know, dropping off the, uh, the meeting. But if anyone wants to stay on and ask questions, um, I see Steve Sarka has had a question. So please stay on. But um, I just want to thank you so much, Dr. Kernew. Um, that was a first for you. You finished the presentation in 20 minutes. So yay. Um, so we look forward to the other um, little bit more in depth uh, topics on heart failure and kidney disease, etc. Uh, but want to thank you so much for a very informative um, program on COVID in the heart and I hope everyone enjoyed. So thank you so much. Uh, please stay on if you'd like to chat and, um, but uh, thank you. That was I want great. To first of all, thank um, Jackie and, and AstraZeneca. I know Jackie forever. And, uh, and uh, when she came back into the territory, I was welcome because she's been so instrumental in getting many of our programs going for, for patient support and having this as well. Because I just want the opportunity for us to get together, um, share some stories and be available. So, I mean, uh, I really it's important. If I can help in any way, I'd like to. Um, it's, you know, it's, this collegiality and things of that nature, somehow we lost it in some way. So, so to me, it's just to bring this back and bring discussions back. And, uh, and if, you know, uh, so you have my, my contact numbers, our, our staff members. Also, too, is it, do you want to play tennis, go bike riding, do the stairs in any way? Fantastic. Uh, we're good at producing webinars that nobody looks at and stuff like that. So uh, everybody welcome to, to look at that. We have the short ones and the long ones. It's, it's been a, a pure joy. I just want to just say that my favorite time is Fridays at seven o'clock when I have all these young people present and we, and uh, it, it's, it's fun to be they're becoming so successful and they're going to change the world. And uh, I, you know, I work with about 70 of them. They're just truly amazing. I, you know, you don't let me touch the computer anymore. I, I, I can I can break it the computer very easily, and uh, 
Um, and uh, and I want to just thank everybody for all their participation and their, their faith in us. And, um, uh, and for those who can stay around, we'll, we'll chat for a little bit. Um, I was promised I'll never I'll never be on time for anything, but I'll, I'll get the things done when it needs to be done. I plan to be late for my funeral as well as my, my biggest thing. <laughs> Uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> and, and, any question, Dr. Zarka? I think you had a question. Is that right? Do I, is there a question there? Want to? You can actually ask it. Actually, um, oh, yeah, sure. want to get? You want to unmute yourself? Yeah, I'm trying to unmute here. Oh, I there think there you can hear me now. Hey, yep. Steve. Yep. Hey, how you doing? Great. Yeah. Yourself? My oh, very well. Thank you. Here, I, I don't like to talk to people that you don't see me. I don't know them. Yeah. There you go. Uh, okay. <laughs> Why is obesity alone a risk factor? Yeah. Well, I think obesity is a risk factor for everything. You know, it's a, it's a marker of cancer. It's a marker of diabetes. It, it's a marker for, for DVTs, chromosome clots. It just nurtures all the risk factors. You know, you, you get cholesterol, you know, and, and you know, we're, we're designed to, to exercise and to be physically fit. And um, I, I, I know, Greg, but, but why? So right? if you have well, someone, let's say, who's obese but has low cholesterol, well, that's possible. So you're still right. at, at a risk. So it's still obesity. So I know obese people get hypertension, obese people get mm -hmm. diabetes. So, but you, you're only obese. You're not hypertensive. You're not diabetic. You're nothing else. You're just okay. obese. Okay. So what you have is markers of inflammation. Look at that big belly there. This belly over here. That, I see it. Kind of that, that, that secretes all these cytokines and inflammatory markers. So everything's gone to inflammation. So 8% of those cytokines are, 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 are basically hypercoagulable, they're cancerogenic, they turn on and off genes. So one of the things is that I've been, re I'm part of the UK uh, vegetarian group. And now I'm not gonna say vegetarian, you know, if you, if you look at, talk a lot of vegetarians, you know, it, it's more religion than science. There is some reasonable science to say um, that, you know, the more overweight you have, uh, the more risk factors you're gonna have the more cancer you're going to have, the more inflammation you're going to have, the more hypercoagulable you're going to have. Um, and if you look at about, you know, there's about 10 to 15 cancers that are associated with weight. It's also, it's also associated with, with infection, uh, you know, like just having more lung infections. So, um, and now it's, so, so, so I think it's just unmasked. I think COVID just unmasked, you know, um, some of the things that overweight can be. Yeah, you can be overweight and be physically fit and do good things. Um, but being overweight, you know, having a body mass index over 25 increases risk. And Dr. Chetty told me this a while ago, and I actually kind of believe this now. And he said, it's a shame not to offer somebody bariatric surgery in a person with a BMI over 40. Um, you're depressed, you're sad, you can't walk, you can't move, you have a lot, a lot of comorbidities. Um, you can treat the blood pressure, you can treat the diabetes, but, you know, lose and and now you can put diabetes into remission by losing 20, 30 pounds. And that's something that I never thought was possible. You know, when you make the diagnosis of type two diabetes, half the beta cells are dead, the rest are acting over time. So it looks like you can actually regenerate some of them. And you know, like type two diabetes, gestational diabetes, you know, it goes away after pregnancy, but it comes back. It means you, you know, you're, you, that, 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 so, so I think it just adds to the stress of multiple systems from orthopedic injuries. You know, you know, the leading cause of hips and knee replacement is age and how much you weigh. So it's just, it's associated with everything. And I don't know about you, my, I don't know how you measure mental health. You know, Harvard did the, the longest study about how, who lives the longest. It's a 60 year trial and shows that quality relationships are important. So um, I think is that I, I see a lot of people who are injured because of their weight from psychologically to physically to all sorts of things. So I think it's just, it just unmasks a series of problems. So, um, so I don't think it's, it's the weight itself. The other thing that it contributes, um, I got sad and depressed when COVID first hit, but uh, my wife got me on my bike and I went outside and I felt so much better. And, you know, it's a tough time for everyone, but being outside uh, when you can do it safely is been such a, it's been so important for my psyche. And having the opportunity to just talk to you and see your face, um, even through Zoom, it helps my psyche, you know? So, um, uh, and uh, and so I'll call you, you later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a long answer, but I think it, 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 it just affects so many systems. And um, and uh, we have to start saying is that uh, love yourself, love your weight, but love le less of your weight. And how do you make yourself love less of you uh, and make it a priority 
and I know it's hard. And um, I know I, I got obsessive about this and something. I weigh myself most days. I, I know my body mass index, my body composition, but I'm having fun doing it. I'm not using it as a, you know, I'm not disappointed when I gain those two to five pounds this week or whatever. I never, I even tried intermittent fasting because our weight loss club wants to do that. So I fast once a week with them because they're doing it. So there's 40 people fasting, I'm fasting um, for 24 hours. Um, I, I, I tried keto diets. Um, I still think, you know, the, the best diet on the planet for most of us is, you know, probably whole grains, plant-based. And um, and I, I believe that, you know, the power of pure EPA Um but, you know, still lots to learn about this. So um, what do you think? I think that obese wives live longer than the husbands who comment on them. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, getting married for us guys, we actually gain extra five years of life. Women who get married lose five years of life. So we, we, cause we, we get all the support and uh, then we leave everything else for our wives to look after. So, uh, so uh so support each other in the best way you possibly can, I guess. That's that, um, um, Perfect.